Good morning, Munglabar. And on behalf of the members of the Agriculture and Rural Development Sector Coordination Group, I'd like to warmly welcome you. We have a diverse audience with around 200 people registering for this event, including members of government, local policy institutes, bilateral, multilateral donors, members of the INGO Forum, CSOs, farmers, and private sector partners. Thank you all for taking time to join us here today. My name is Matt Curtis from USAID's Office of Economic Growth, and I'll be today's moderator. I'd like to make everyone aware that this presentation is being recorded. It'll be posted on the IFPRI Myanmar website so that if you need to review any portions or want to share it with someone, you can do that later. USAID, along with FAO, are the donor facilitators for the Agriculture and Rural Development Sector Coordination Group. This is the second in a series of webinars hosted by members of this group on the impact of COVID-19 on the agri-food system and rural communities. Thanks to the International Food Policy Research Institute, or IFPRI, for hosting today's webinar. We are pleased to have presentations by Michigan State University, Proximity Design, and Mercy Corps. It's been three months since the lockdown in April, and we've, been, we've seen international and domestic migrants return, trade disrupted, and many workers laid off. The government, private sector, civil society, and development partners have responded rapidly. Mowali is providing inputs, tractor services, cash for work. MEB, MADB are providing additional loans to farmers, and new loan products to SMEs. Farmers are connecting to markets through e-commerce platforms. Community groups are helping to focus relief to the most vulnerable. And development partners are reprogramming activities to support these locally led efforts. Even with all these mitigation measures in place, much is still unknown about the shock to household income and disrupted supply chains and how these shocks will impact the agri-food system and rural households. We are now entering the monitoring phase of the mitigation measures. And the surveys presented today are not only diagnostic, but will help us understand how effective these mitigation measures are and if we need to modify and adapt them to improve their effectiveness. We are privileged today to have three presentations and a panel discussion. Our first presentation will be by Dr. Joseph Goeb from Michigan State University. Dr. Goeb is a research associate for Michigan State University's Department of Agriculture, Food and Resource Economics. He's based in Yangon, and is working on the Myanmar Agriculture Policy Support Activity led by IFPRI and Michigan State University. He previously lived in Zambia for three years, working closely with smallholder farmers and conducting research on pesticide safety and agriculture extension. Next, we will be pleased to have Ma Tet Nin A, who leads the social impact team at Proximity Design and oversees the in-house impact surveys of proximity uh, products and services. She brings many years of experience in customer research and business consulting, as she previously managed the planning and analytics team for the customer research at Thoreau Swiss, a market research and consulting firm in Yangon. Our final, final survey presentation will be from uh, Mr. Uh, Wayu uh, Nurugo. Uh, he is the market systems development specialist at Mercy Corps Myanmar. He has been in the development sector for almost 20 years, including a 10 years uh, with Mercy Corps. He's been in Myanmar for almost two years now, leading the market systems development work for Mercy Corps, which includes the rice value chain project in the Delta region. Our panelists include U Tinta U, who serves both as the chairman of the agriculture group of Yoma Strategic Holding and as the principal CEO of agribusiness and rural development consultants. Previously, U Tinta U served as director general of the Department of Agriculture Planning under the Ministry of Agriculture and Irrigation for eight of his 37 years in public service. And our second panelist is Dr. Duncan Bowden. He serves as the Chief of Party for the Myanmar Agriculture Policy Support Activity and is a professor of international development at Michigan State University, a policy advisor for the Ministry of Agriculture, Livestock and Irrigation of the Government of Myanmar, and a lecturer at Yezin Agriculture University. Now, if you have any questions during the presentations, then I encourage you to write them down in the question box to the right of your screen. If you want to direct them to a specific panelist, then uh, please note that in the question. And with that, we're going to move on to our first presentation, uh, Dr. Goeb, on the impact of COVID-19 on the agricultural trade sector. So please begin. Great. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I'm excited to share uh, a lot of uh, effort on behalf of my team um, on some phone surveys conducted on the upstream and midstream uh, actors in Myanmar's agri-food system. Next slide, Michael. 
So this is where we're headed. A uh, quick overview uh, of all our phone surveys that we're conducting. Uh, I'll outline some key results, and then I'll dive into each of the individual phone surveys. We've kind of structured it around the upstream phone surveys, or upstream and agricultural food system, uh, with input retailers and mech service providers. And then we go to the midstream, where we have uh, some results from crop traders and rice millers. And I'll summarize and then uh, outline some recommendations from the results. Next. So this is kind of a, a stylized uh, depiction of Myanmar's agri-food system, and it kind of outlines uh, our approach to the phone surveys um, in analyzing and, and understanding what's going on in the agri-food system. So each item in these boxes is a separate survey, phone survey, that our team, uh, led by IFPRI and with MSU, is, are conducting. Our focus uh, for this presentation will be on the the upstream and the midstream, uh, the bolded boxes, but um, we'll be having some results to share later on and from some of the other surveys. Um, very quickly, the, the upstream uh, survey, when it was conducted uh, starting uh, early uh, monsoon season, we think is a good leading indicator of agricultural production. So that was a big point of emphasis was to get those surveys up and running. Uh, the midstream surveys, um, the traders in particular, they're the first link in the agri-food system after the farm, so they play an important role in marketing uh, for the farms, but also they, they connect to the, the rest of the agri-food system and also have implications for consumers as well. So, um, yeah, that's going to be our focus today, uh, the upstream and midstream. Next slide. So this kind of gives a, a more detailed overview of, of these phone surveys. Uh, we have three uh, in the upstream and two in the midstream. Um, from a kind of uh, motivation standpoint, uh, each of these surveys is following, uh, to some degree, a, an in-person study conducted previously by a project uh, going back to 2017 in the, in the central dry zone, a value chain study on oil seeds and pulses uh, in 2018 in, in Shan State, and then uh, a 2019 study on, on rice millers, which uh, we didn't conduct, but we're using their sample. Um, you'll notice that the, the upstream surveys, we've completed more rounds. So we have uh, done multiple rounds in, in each of those surveys with one more remaining. Again, this was because it was important to get those to the field as a leading indicator of ag production for the monsoon season. Um, monsoon season, or the midstream surveys rather, are kind of uh, slowly developing. We have two rounds of surveys completed for crop traders and one for rice millers. Um, and each of the surveys has kind of a different geographical coverage based on, on our previous studies and also on what other sample we could, we could collect from other sources uh, for phone survey contacts. Uh, next slide, Michael. Okay, so um, before we get into it, I'll kind of outline the, the, the key results to tell you where we're headed. So uh, basically we're seeing that uh, early on uh, in the COVID-19 crisis, movement restrictions and lockdowns had a, a negative effect across the, the food supply chain. Um, but as those restrictions were lifted and kind of as the monsoon season progressed, as the rains came, um, business accelerated across the agri-food system, but uh, it's not a full recovery, at least not yet. So demand is still lower, um, sales are lower kind of across the board um, this year compared to last year. Um, this is not all due to COVID-19, we can't claim that, but, but definitely some of it. Um, and revenues are down for each of the, the links in the chain in the agri-food system. And one kind of persistent uh, challenge or effect that we're seeing um, that is having longer lasting effects rather than the kind of immediate effects of the uh, movement restrictions is that firms are having a hard time collecting repayment on loans and, and informal credit that they've lent out uh, to farmers primarily um, at the beginning of the monsoon season. So that's something that uh, we'll continue to track as we go forward. But now we'll get into each of our individual surveys. Next slide. Oh, there we are. So, um, yeah, now we're getting into the upstream surveys with 
ag input retailers and mechanization service providers and equipment retailers, which are two separate surveys, but we're kind of presenting those results together. So next slide, Michael. All right, so um, we've done four rounds of ag input retailer surveys um, at two week intervals starting in late May. Um, our sample size, we've had some attrition, so that's been kind of a, a, a challenge in doing phone surveys as we've lost some of our sample each round, but it is a panel, so we're calling the same the same shops every time. Our coverage here is Shan, Iowati, Bago, Kachin, Mandalay, and Sagain. So a lot of states and regions, but definitely not the whole country. It's not representative of any particular region, um, but it is kind of a, a good spread, we feel, to get an indication of what's happening uh, in the sector. Our, our objectives for the survey and kind of uh, for all the surveys really, first and foremost, are to identify and monitor uh, the COVID-19 effects on the agri-food system. Um, we had different points of emphasis for each survey. And so for ag input retailers, transportation and credit were two of those uh, points of emphasis. Um, we also uh, really wanted to learn how businesses are responding, what they're doing in, in face of these uh, challenges. And uh, yeah, as a leading into indicator of monsoon production, we also wanted to track uh, input sales over time with these retailers. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so this paints a pretty bleak picture of uh, demand early on in May and June 2020 compared to um, uh, 2019 at the same time. So you see that over half of the input retailers were reporting less or lower fertilizer sales and maize seed sales um, than the year previously, and very few uh, were reporting higher sales or sales increases year over year. Um, we tracked these four inputs in particular because it seemed to be uh, the, the main inputs uh, sold uh, kind of across the region uh, by, by the, the input retailers. There's definitely some heterogeneity and variation across regions, but um, these are pretty uh, consistent across the region. Um, one interesting result to pull out of this and something we've been able to dig into a little more uh, is that the vegetable seed um, sales seem to be kind of least impacted. Um, they're lower, their smallest decreases year over year. Um, one thing we found there is that the input retail shops that sell primarily to commercial um, vegetable producers, those growing for sale, um, had actually large decreases in uh, in sales of vegetable seed, but those selling primarily to households for for own consumption, those that are growing for uh, small household gardens, um, have pretty stable uh, seed sales uh, this year as compared to last year. So that's an important result. I think that the households do have access to the seed, but the market conditions um, are not favorable and, and larger scale commercial farmers are not growing them, um, at least from the input retailer side, appears at the same rate they did last year. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so this kind of uh, outlines some of the key uh, disruptions uh, from, from the COVID-19 crisis for ag input retailers. Uh, each bar on the on the figure is a different survey round, and it's the share of input retailers reporting uh, this disruption at the time of the survey. So the kind of story I'd like to pull out of this is that, uh, first of all, demand, uh, the, the largest effect or factor uh, mentioned by 64% of the, the input retailers in the first round, um, but it does decrease over time. And, and, and as the rounds of the survey progress, um, it becomes less of a factor. Um, the same thing with supply. It started out uh, high at about 45% of the input retailers are saying it's it's hard to buy or to acquire inputs, um, but that disruption also falls uh, over time, uh, particularly uh, in the in the last round of the survey. But the the kind of second from the top, the difficulty collecting credit and loan repayments, uh, does show decreases across the survey rounds, but it's relatively small in incremental decreases, right? So a, a still a high share. So we're talking about um, over 45% of these input retailers are reporting difficulty collecting credit repayments uh, on the loans, the loans they've lent out 
uh, to farmers. Um, and that will be kind of a, a consistent story across um, uh, actors and as we go forward in the presentation. Next slide. Uh, one interesting thing we're, we're seeing with the ag input retailers is uh, use of cell phones as an adaptation, a business adaptation in response um, to the COVID-19 crisis. Um, approximately 25% uh, in, in any given survey around are reporting increased cell phone use, um, either uh, to reach uh, supply, contact their suppliers, or to reach customers even. So um, the table kind of shows the percent of shops that have ever used a cell phone for the um, different uh, different features um, and the median use rate and then uh, kind of expected changes. Um, far and away, uh, using a cell phone to contact suppliers um, uh, outweighs those that are using them to contact customers. But still, uh, a lot of them are conducting or, or organizing sales of inputs over the phone. And then that follows up with, with some kind of delivery service for a lot of these input retailers. Um, and as a way to kind of keep, uh, keep the sales up and to reach the farmers at, at times of, of movement restrictions. Um, mobile payment use rates are kind of lower, um, but there is a significant increase uh, year over year. So compared to 2019, uh, more input retailers are using uh, mobile payment for purchases uh, than they were last year. And kind of the, the lowest adoption rate is for uh, mobile payment for, for sales to farmers. And input retailers are simply saying that face-to-face uh, -face sale, sales, even, um, even at the time of uh, the crisis, are still kind of the most reliable way uh, to reach farmers. Next slide. Yeah, so this paints a, a, a pretty bleak picture of uh, revenue changes, expected revenue changes in 2020 compared to 2019. 64% um, are saying that their revenue will decrease 20% or more um, this year as compared to last year. And almost no one is saying uh, optimistically that they will have an increase in revenue uh, compared to last year. Um, and again, this is something we'll see uh, in other uh, actors in the agri-food system uh, with the later surveys. Next slide. So now we're going to shift gears. Uh, still in the in the upstream uh, sector, we're talking about mechanization. Uh, we have two surveys. We have service providers and in equipment retailers. Um, these surveys have been conducted kind of at three-week intervals. Uh, they've done three rounds, and we have one more to go, which will happen kind of around uh, harvest season um, in October. Uh, research questions here are pretty similar uh, to the other survey, the Ag Input Retailers, but uh, focusing on uh, maybe special emphasis on financial challenges and what the coping mechanisms are, um, and also what policy interventions might be beneficial uh, for firms. Next slide. So uh, here again, we see a decreased demand this year, both for MEX services um, and this is true across uh, regions in the dry zone and in the delta. And we also see decreased demand for equipment sales. Very dramatic decreases here uh, with over half of the equipment retailers saying um, greater than 50% decrease this year compared to last year in their equipment sales. So um, very limited uh, capital investments on the part of farmers uh, this monsoon season compared to last monsoon season. Next slide, please. Okay, so this slide uh, kind of highlights how the uh, lifting of the movement restrictions um, kind of eased the, the disruptions to uh, MEX service providers and equipment retailers. So um, each slide, each uh, table here shows uh, June and May separately um, with much lower disruptions in June. So. Um, the share of MEX service providers that were restricted to a smaller geographical area, so where they were operating and where they could go uh, with their um, with their tractors or, or combine harvesters, uh, was was much lower in June uh, as compared to May. Um, and a similar story for equipment retailers, where uh, a much smaller share uh, are reporting uh, logistical disruptions or um, uh, difficulties uh, delivering on existing orders in June as compared to May. Um, next slide.
Okay, so this this gets to the uh, the heart of the the credit story and the difficulty in in collecting repayments um, from farmers. So um, again, we have May and June, but in in terms of credit difficulties, um, we see an increase uh, in some cases of of the the share of respondents reporting issues. So uh, for MEX service providers, there's actually a pretty steep increase from May to June in the share of the providers that uh, received a request for late payment. So farmers saying, um, asking for the services to be done kind of on credit where they could pay back later. Um, and then equipment retailers have pretty stable or um, even increasing in the dry zone, or excuse me, in the Delta, um, delayed loan repayments um, on their sales uh, from June as compared to May. And again, this, these results are kind of consistent across uh, agroecological zones um, and across sectors. Next slide. So this, uh, uh, this shows the uh, expected revenue decreases. Um, yeah, basically showing pretty bleak picture where very few um, uh, firms are expecting higher revenues this year uh, than they were last year. Um, particularly um, large share, 47 percent in the in the Delta region of equipment retailers, expecting uh, at least a 10 percent reduction in revenue in 2020 uh, as compared to 2019. Next slide. Okay, so now we're going to shift gears and go uh, to the midstream uh, just after the farm, and we have crop traders and rice millers in this section. Next slide. So for crop traders, we've conducted two rounds of phone surveys. Um, in round two, we actually supplemented our more quantitative phone surveys with uh, 16 qualitative interviews to kind of supplement it and uh, bolster uh, our understanding of what's happening uh, in for crop traders. Our regional coverage is uh, Shan, Mandalay, Sagain, and McGuay, um, and similar objectives to the other studies. Uh, and here we kind of want to also track commodity sales uh, over time. And with again, with the midstream actors, this is kind of um, more getting at what happened pre-monsoon as they've already been harvested in kind of the summer season. Um, but we hope to learn insights about what will happen uh, in, the, in the monsoon season for harvesting and sales um, and the marketing activity there. And we'll continue to track that uh, with more rounds of the survey extending through to October. Next slide. Okay, so the, the kind of story here um, is that transportation restrictions and government required closures um, for traders um, were very, uh, had strong effects or were large challenges early on, okay? Um, but if you look kind of to the right half of, of this figure, you'll see that uh, most of those challenges or most of those traders are no longer reporting uh, challenges to transportation restrictions or to government required closures. Um, and this again tells the story that uh, it was a big issue early on with the restrictions, but, but things have kind of come out of it and they're no longer, uh, for the most part, no longer a main uh, hindrance um, to, um, there may be some regional variation there, but no longer a main hindrance to a lot of crop trading activity. However, um, lower crop prices was the highest cited, largest share of crop traders were saying it's the uh, uh, main challenge to their business um, this year as compared to last year. Um, and they, about a third of them are saying that there has been no change. So they're still experiencing low crop prices and very few are saying that it's no longer a challenge at all. So that's kind of a more uh, persistent uh, challenge than the transport restrictions or required closures. Next slide. So that gets this slide gets into that in a little more detail. Um, we show that uh, for oil seeds and pulses and, and for vegetables uh, to some degree, um, there was a lot of a high share of crop traders were reporting price decreases this year compared to last year. 55% um, were reporting a decreased uh, price uh, overall. But if you split out maize from that picture, um, maize actually is the exception. 
So there's been a lot of reported price increases for maize this year as compared to last year. Um, and we think part of the reason why is because of the very depressed prices last year as China closed the border uh, to trade and the market had to kind of adjust to that shock. Um, and now actually there's some kind of uh, bounce back in a sense, um, despite the coronavirus uh, limitations. Um, next slide. So we also see uh, crop traders adapting um, to the to the challenges posed by the COVID-19 crisis by using cell phones more often. Um, again, we see higher shares or higher use rates for um, organizing, uh, selling over the phone or buying over the phone and coordinating sales over the phone, um, but lower use rates for mobile payments, either uh, to buyers or to sellers. Um, there's a kind of an interesting difference uh, when you break it out by, by brokers and wholesalers, uh, where, where brokers seem to be uh, adopting the mobile phone technology at a much higher rate, particularly um, for, for using mobile payments. But um, we need to dig into that to understand a little bit more about what's happening. But part of the picture could be um, that wholesalers actually had a higher use rate uh, going into the crisis and therefore uh, less room to kind of increase adoption afterwards. But um, that's speculative at this point. We still need to dig into that a little bit. Next slide. So here's our revenue picture for crop traders. Um, again, uh, very few crop traders are expecting higher revenues this year as compared to last year. And 42% uh, are saying that their revenues will drop in, in expectation 25% or more. Um, it's, a, it's a very uh, bleak picture uh, for crop traders right now. Um, one thing we wanna track is uh, does this lead to entry slash exit for, for traders? Does it lead to some kind of consolidation uh, in, the, in the trading sector? Um, or uh, do people kind of waiting on deck with the slower business able to kind of hang in there and wait until the monsoon harvest and then ramp up activity as needed? So that's something that we're gonna track in the future rounds of the survey. Next slide. Okay, our last survey uh, that we're gonna discuss is for rice millers. This is very preliminary results. Uh, we've only done one round of, of survey here covering Iowati, uh, Bago, and Yangon, um, and similar objectives to the other surveys um, here, kind of tracking buying and selling activity and monthly changes uh, for rice millers, and also year-over-year uh, -year comparisons to 2019. Next slide. All right, this, um, I think I'm running on time, but this is a lot to unpack. So uh, maybe we focus um, at kind of the last three items, uh, the bottom three on this uh, figure to the right. So this is uh, showing disruptions in both at any time since the start of the COVID-19 crisis, which is in blue, uh, and in the last seven days prior to the, prior to the interview, which is in orange. Um, so similar to the other surveys, we see dramatic, very uh, high shares of rice millers saying, uh, you know, movement restrictions and, and it's difficult to buy and also hard to sell. Um, at some point uh, due to the, the COVID-19 crisis, um, but in the last seven days, the, that share has dropped to about 15 percent, uh, experiencing difficulties either on the demand side or the supply side in reaching markets or buyers. Um, Again, though, with the credit, collecting credit repayments um, to, to farmers on credit lent let out, uh, a much smaller decrease. So in the last seven days, there is a much smaller share reporting uh, um, disruptions um, from credit repayments, uh, but it is still, uh, it's still high. So it's 28% uh, are experiencing that now um, as compared to about 45%. Uh, at any time in the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, next slide. Here's the revenue picture uh, for rice millers. Um, again, just uh, over or half of them are saying, expecting 30% or more decrease in the revenue this year as compared to last year. Next slide. And here's the um, the Miller's reported uh, 
what policies might be most beneficial to their business. Um, so government supported loans uh, came out very strongly um, as, as, a, as a support that, that might help milling and the sector in general. This is a sector that was pretty dynamic and kind of rapidly um, changing and adapting and, and growing, um, modernizing, I think, um, before the COVID-19 crisis. So that might be slowed down and, and firms might be wanting to continue that um, with the government supported loans. Um, uh, no one likes to pay taxes, so 45% said tax cuts or deferrals um, would be a beneficial policy and consistent electricity supply, not much to do with COVID-19, but um, they see that as, as being a, a beneficial policy. Next slide. Okay, so uh, just to summarize quickly, um, yeah, the, the, the early on movement restrictions, um, together with kind of some late monsoon rains in some parts, Sagain and, and the dry zone in particular, um, really resulted in decreased business, business activity. Um, and that was lower revenues for firms um, and at every uh, stage that we've studied uh, in the agri-food system. Um, but as those uh, restrictions were lifted, business did it pick up. It accelerated, but it didn't fully recover. Um, farm demand uh, this year is still much lower as compared to last year. Um, so we'll see what that implication, the implication for that is for uh, household revenues and, and ag production. Um, hopefully from some of our other presentations today or our other surveys that are ongoing. Um, and that could be because farm households have, have lower incomes um, and there's also increased uncertainty at these times. Um, so uh, the persistent challenge that, that comes across uh, from all the surveys is uh, repayment on credit. So informal credit is a big part of this uh, agri-food system as we've seen. Um, and these actors, these firms, max service providers, equipment retailers, traders, um, ag input suppliers, they're absorbing a lot of uh, delayed payments. Um, so they, they may have cash flow problems later on. This may have knock-on effects to their own uh, ability to pay off loans or to acquire new credit. Um, so this is something that we, uh, we need to track as we move forward. Um, yeah, next slide. Okay, so our recommendation. So the, the, the lockdowns, while necessary from an uh, epidemiological standpoint, are, uh, are important, but um, you know, they did have large negative effects, we think, um, on trade and, and on the agri-food system. So I think it would be beneficial to look forward and think about how we could design uh, future lockdown protocols, um, if need be, uh, in the coming months, uh, that would allow for these key actors um, to stay open and continue to function um, uh, despite uh, locking down what needs to be locked down. Um, we are late in the monsoon season, but in some areas, uh, cash support to farmers could still have big effects. And even uh, where, um, you know, monsoon season is too advanced to invest in inputs, uh, fertilizer uh, this year uh, or this season, uh, there's always the post-monsoon season. There are places where uh, cash support to farmers could still have uh, large benefits um, in terms of uh, financing combine harvesting um, and also helping to pay off some of the uh, existing outstanding debt um, that they have from, from credit. Um, the firms uh, that have absorbed uh, that, that credit and that debt, um, the loan uh, repayments uh, could benefit perhaps from working capital loan support. Um, also, you, delaying and in some cases removing the business taxes and fees would help with some of the cash flow issues uh, that some of these firms are facing. Um, and as always, these, these policies uh, should be tailored to specific contexts and, and the different agroecologies and conditions uh, in Myanmar. Next slide. So that wraps it up. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Dr. Goeb. Lots of great data, and you generated lots of questions that we can get to uh, during the panel discussion. Uh, we'll now move uh, to a presentation by Matet on the impact of COVID-19 on farmers in rural Myanmar. Uh, so please begin whenever you're ready. Thank you, Les. 
and thank you everyone for joining today's webinar. So I will be presenting the research findings from uh, proximity survey that we have been conducting over the past uh, three months. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, so I would like to start off with a quote uh, from one of our pharma interview. Uh, one pharma saying that there has been delays in every aspect of uh, every aspect for this year monsoon paddy. So lack of rainfall, lack rainfall, lack of irrigation water, and lack of capital for family expenses. I think uh, this situation is uh, a lot of pharma suffering experiences at the moment, and our research findings also reflect and will be uh, in more details. Next slide, please. So this is the agenda for my presentation. I will first talk about the background of our research service and uh, followed by the main findings from our service. And I will summarize the key insights and uh, put forward some of the recommendations. Next slide, please. So uh, what point did we conduct a research service from proximity side? So next slide, please. Research uh, farmers has been at the core of our values and mission for proximity. We have been serving uh, farmers since 2004, and our mission has been to improve the lives of farmers through affordable and income boosting products and services. So we understand that uh, we have to understand, we have to know what is happening on the ground to best serve our farmers. So when the outbreak started in April, uh, our first response has been to conduct quick surveys to understand what is happening and how it has affected farmers in real uh, in the on the ground. Next slide, please. So we started our tractor surveys in April. April. So our primary data collection has been uh, on, through online surveys. So we recruit, recruit around 400 farmers. Uh, every week uh, initially, and now we have moved to bi weekly basis uh, through Facebook uh, user base. To complement this online service, we have also conducted four interviews with our customers every week as well, uh, around four, uh, 50 farmers every week. We have also utilized our FIFO staff presence in uh, different projects across the country so that uh, we understand better uh, market conditions, market prices, and socio political situations in the townships they are living in. So, up to date, we have uh, surveyed around over 5,000 responses since April 2020. Next slide, please. Our main limitation of our sampling methodology is the representativeness of the sampling population. Because uh, we are using Facebook user base of farmers, those farmers uh, tend to be more uh, tech savvy, more knowledgeable, and also more dominant than an average farmer population. Our phone interviews are also conducted with our customers, so it is quite limited to the areas we are operating in, and also uh, those uh, our customers are tend to be more less uh, less risk averse. Next slide, please. So next session, I will be presenting uh, the main findings from our research service. Next slide, please. So we know that uh, farmers have been affected uh, by the uh, pandemic outbreak. So our research findings show that over 95% of farmers have been affected to some degree uh, from the situation by the end of May. So the situation has been the worst around late April and early May, but it seems to be improving over the past month. Next slide. The main impact farmers have been experiencing from this pandemic is mainly on the crop sales and crop prices. So the crop sales and crop prices were largely affected again since April up to late uh, late um, April uh, because of the closures in markets and also travel restrictions. Most affected uh, from our research service, most affected were uh, horticulture crop farmers and also flower growers uh, because, uh, because of the perishable nature of their crops. We also found that more and more farmers have been reporting that uh, they have been experiencing increasing input cost, uh, especially uh, in the early May, early May up to late May. So this situation seems to be also improving once the markets have been reopening and shops are also reopening. Next slide, please. 
Another impact uh, farmers has also experienced is on the food supply situation. So we have also asked whether there has been any difficulties in getting the food supplies. And the situation was the worst around late April at the peak of the lockdowns and travel restrictions, but uh, it has also rebounded since then. Next slide, please. So uh, with all this impact on their family income, crop sales and prices, farmers' financial resources have also been declining over this uh, past three-month period. So we, uh, according to our latest surveys, in the first week of July, only 22% of farmers have reported that they have enough cash to buy for the next, uh, next few months. So it is a decrease by 40% compared to the early April results, where 36% of farmers reported that they have enough to get buying for the next few months. Next slide, please. Yeah, so with the financial resources uh, decline deteriorating, um, how are they faring up uh, regarding their uh, repayment the repayment of loans? So farmers are quite worried about the repay repayment of loans, especially in uh, late April and early May. Uh, but in June, farmers were less concerned than previous weeks uh, about their repairing their loans. It's also because uh, most farmers have uh, sold their crops and uh, sold their crops, uh, so they have uh, some cash to pay back their loans. Next slide, please. So moving forward, uh, what are the plans for the monsoon planet, uh, planting season? Uh, from the earlier quote, we see that there has been a lot of delays in the monsoon, uh, for the monsoon season. But uh, according to our latest survey, uh, in the first week of June, uh, July, 85% of farmers have uh, started preparing or already finished uh, preparing for the monsoon uh, planting season. Among those farmers, 61% uh, of the 61% of them have reported that they have been facing some challenges uh, to prepare their monsoon activities. Next slide, please. So the top challenge that they are facing is uh, not having enough cash to buy inputs, as 30% of farmers have reported in the first week of July. This is also because uh, of a lot of disruptions have been uh, a lot of disruptions have disrupted uh, the operations and long distance of MFIs and MDB, and they, so most of the farmers haven't got uh, their loans, the crop loans, in time. Um, so uh, farmers have been at a cash strap to buy imports for their monsoon, uh, monsoon activities. In addition to these uh, challenges, farmers have also expressed concerns over uh, weather conditions, especially the late rainfall and also the availability of irrigation water. It's like this. So this is uh, another quote uh, from one of the Finley farmers from Kalor, uh, to, uh, describing how uh, farmers have been cast up to buy inputs and to invest in their family activities. She's saying that uh, in the past when she received loans, she could buy all the inputs she needs in one time, but uh, now she has to end a little bit here and there just to buy a small amount of inputs. It's like this. So uh, this is the last session where I will be uh, summarizing uh, the key insights from our service and also put forward some of the recommendations. Next slide, please. So uh, our research findings uh, clearly shows that there is a challenge for farmers to grow their monsoon, uh, monsoon crops. The repayment concerns were also prevalent among the farmers in the past, uh, in the past two months. In addition to uh, this financial situation, um, farmers have been also experiencing a lot of challenges for to grow their monsoon crops. One of them being the disruptions uh, in the operations of MEDV and MFIs, resulting in farmers not getting access to long in time for their monsoon, uh, monsoon growing season. In addition to that, uh, farmers are experiencing increasing input costs, as well as unfavorable credit terms uh, from uh, input traders and dealers. So next slide, please. So I would like to uh, put forward three main recommendations uh, based on the key, key insights. One is to 
uh, to ensure timely availability of uh, loans for farmers. So policies that support MFIs and MDBs so that they can disperse their loans uh, to farmers in time would improve the, the farmers' financial uh, financial conditions and also increase their investments in their family activities. Second is to ensure availability and affordability of imports. So policies like uh, subsidies for import traders and dealers, easing up trade and travel restrictions for agricultural imports and outputs could uh, provide farmers with better credit terms and uh, availability of imports. Lastly, uh, is to improve climate adaptability of farmers. So this is not directly related to uh, COVID-19 uh, challenges, but it, this has been an additional challenge for farmers. So, providing location specific weather information, uh, providing climate adapted practices, and better climate resilient crop varieties could help farmers adapt better to these chi uh, changing climate conditions. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, uh, so this, that's bring us to the end of my presentation. So, if you have any, um, if you need uh, additional questions or information, you can also contact me via my email. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mata. Wonderful presentation, rich information, and uh, just a, a great farmer perspective. Uh, so we'll now have uh, Mr. Negroho from Mercy Corps present their findings on the impact of COVID-19 on smallholder farmers and food systems in the Delta. Mr. Negroho, over to you. Uh, thanks, Matt. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks uh, for the opportunity to share our rapid market assessment in the Iowa G Delta that was uh, funded by LIF and uh, carried out by Mercy Corps, WHH, and Village Link. Next slide, please. So, unlike the previous presentation where data uh, have been collected uh, over several period of times, this assessment was uh, just a one-off study that was uh, conducted uh, with a specific focus on uh, the economic impact of COVID-19 pandemic on household and market actors, uh, primarily those who engage in rice and uh, process value chains uh, in the Delta uh, to better understand the current impact of the crisis has had on uh, their livelihoods and businesses and how uh, those actors uh, anticipate their livelihood, food security, or uh, businesses to be further impacted uh, in the near uh, to medium term uh, due to challenges given the context at the time. Uh, non probability sampling methods were used, uh, data collection were done uh, through online surveys and phone interviews uh, by leveraging uh, relationship uh, that was already established by Mercy Corps, WHH, and Village Link with uh, the respondents uh, through previous and existing work uh, in the region. Uh, total 661 respondents uh, participated in the assessment, where uh, 456 respondents were farmers. Uh, they are uh, Toyota uh, application users, and the remaining respondents were uh market actors along the value chains uh, as you can see on the uh, left side of uh, of the presentation uh next slide please so uh here are two satellite uh, image uh, to indicate uh, comparison on uh, agriculture production between summer season and monsoon monsoon season uh, in the Iowa Delta. So the, the, the left side map is the last uh, summer season uh, ended in May this year. If you see the fast areas of yellow and light green on the map, uh, they depict uh, rice and other crops which uh, had been harvested over the last couple of months uh, from April to May and June uh, across the region. Uh, it covered uh, almost 600,000 hectares of rice and uh, around 500,000 hectares of other crops, uh, mostly grams, uh, pulses, sesame, uh, and vegetables. Uh, well, the map uh, on the right side is the map of the uh, last year mon uh, monsoon season. Uh, this year monsoon season was just started uh, when we did the surface so that we couldn't able to get an updated map for this purpose but uh, as you can see it suggests uh, expanded areas of rice production 
uh, during last year monsoon uh, there's more than uh, 1.7 million hectares of rice growing uh, areas in the delta and certainly uh, it will be interesting to get uh, an updated uh, one for this year uh, within this coming months uh, to see uh, to get a factual uh, uh, indication of the impact of uh, COVID-19 uh, to this year monsoon uh, season. Next slide, please. So some of uh, the key findings from the assessment. Firstly, uh, it was quite a surprise uh, that farmers and some extent also local government officials uh, they have a more optimistic view uh, regarding uh, the impact of uh, the pandemic and in many cases uh, in direct contradiction to the views uh, of other stakeholders uh, despite the reported uh, severity of the impact of the pandemic for example only 13 uh, percent of farmers who said that the pandemic uh, do not impact their livelihood uh, with uh, 53 percent of uh, them had already experienced a reduction in income uh, since the pandemic uh, began uh, but interestingly uh, most farmers believe that they uh, would be able to cultivate similar amount of land and grow similar products uh, this uh, monsoon season uh, than previous years uh, with 96% uh, uh, of them uh, did not believe uh, the pandemic uh, will reduce their ability to get uh, quality seeds and 91% did not expect that COVID-19 pandemic will whatsoever impact their uh, yields uh, for this uh, monsoon season. Next slide, please. However, when uh, farmers uh, were asked what will happen if the impacts of the COVID-19 are prolonged uh, for more than three months and six months, uh, the responses were uh, rather bleak. Uh, so if uh, they said that if the, con if the crisis continues for another three months, 28% uh, of them uh, mentioned that they will have to uh, consume less food and uh, another 25% of them mentioned that uh, they will need to reduce uh, the frequency of their meals. Uh, as you can see from the graph, if uh, the crisis will continue, for another six months, uh, the food security situation will be even more bleak. Uh, you can see increases in uh, all uh, mentioned uh, coping mechanism. Uh, however, uh, the timing and seasonality of this finding uh, should be noted. The assessment was conducted in between uh, harvesting period of summer season and prior to the monsoon season, which is the uh, main planting season. Uh, uh, and uh, this is typically a time uh, of uh, heightened uh, food security uh, in the region, uh, which means uh, smallholders uh, might already be enacting a certain uh, coping strategy. However, still it was argued that the pandemic has and uh, will continue to put additional pressure uh, on the food security situation uh, in that area. Next slide, please. Views uh, of uh, private sector actors were in stark contrast uh, to those farmers and local government officials. Uh, for example, uh, when majority of farmers uh, that was uh, accounted for about 83% said that they don't anticipate difficulty to get quality inputs uh, this season, but 62 uh, seed producers, uh, all interview seed companies, and 82% uh, of agro uh, dealers said that they expect uh, less demand uh, compared to last year and uh, yeah just want to uh, show you uh, you see in the slide that there are two contradicting statements one from a uh, regional government official uh, which is quite uh, optimistic uh, about the resilience of the agri food system in the delta and uh, another one from the uh, seed producer which uh, expressed uh, otherwise uh, concern. Next slide, please. So, uh, consistent with the previous presentations, uh, the measures uh, taken uh, 
by the government to contain uh, COVID-19 spread, uh, including imposed restriction and others uh, have uh, significantly affected the uh, agricultural trade and market system across all levels uh, in the region. Uh, despite the influx of uh, migrants uh, to home village, uh, difficulties in obtaining labor for farming and to support businesses were identified as uh, an immediate impact of the pandemic. Uh, private sector respondents uh, mentioned uh, that a shortage of labor has driven up wages, increasing their expenses and overall cost of doing businesses. Some uh, respondents were also concerned about the ability of skilled uh, laborers, especially operators, uh, to use machineries. And as uh, production costs increase, uh, while income uh, reduce and access to loan were difficult, uh, market actors were forced uh, to adopt uh, some uh, suboptimal responses. For example, half of the interviewed millers uh, mentioned that uh, they cannot run their mills uh, as regularly uh, simply to reduce uh, their costs. Uh, MFIs uh, mentioned that uh, they challenge with their own uh, financing obligation, uh, especially obligation related to their own domestic and uh, international loans uh, and obligation uh, to their other investors. And this combined with the negative impact from the previous operational uh, suspensions uh, imply that uh, they will have to cut back on uh, monsoon lending in the absence of uh, significant uh, capital injections. And as uh, financial institutions uh, play a critical role in funding all actors engaged in the agriculture uh, value chain, uh, their inability to uh, provide loans uh, will certainly have uh, knock-on effects uh, on the economy as a whole. Uh, and then despite the increase of uh, food demands, uh, especially in the beginning of the pandemic, uh, that were driven uh, by fears uh, of approaching shortage or increased price among uh, consumers and also uh, public in general. Uh, however, trade and transport uh, restriction uh, uh, has made uh, more challenging for market actors to benefit from that increased demand. Market actors were also challenged uh, by increasing uh, uncertainty of supply and demand due to information asymmetry, uh, leading them to implement various measures, especially to uh, reduce uh, their costs. Uh, next slide, please. So here are some of uh, the recommendation uh, from the assessment and uh, its connection with the CRP. Uh, certainly, uh, it is important to continue connect farmers and markets, uh, market actors uh, with the stimulus uh, provided by uh, the CRP. And uh, smart subsidy for inputs and, and cash programming, either uh, cash transfer or uh, cash for works, uh, especially targeting the most vulnerable seems to be uh, something that have been have to be done uh, immediately uh, and then uh, certainly debt relief uh, and adjustment to loan repayment are something that uh, can be also done to help those who has challenge with uh, their uh, financial obligations and uh, lastly certainly uh, promote a more digital solution uh, to payment, uh, information sharing, and other things. And yeah, that's that's all from my side. And uh, thank you for your attention. Over to you, Matt. Thank you, Mr. Nagoho. Uh, thanks for the systems perspective and for linking it to the CERP. I think that's uh, great for those recommendations. And so finally, we're going to ask uh, U U to provide a private sector perspective on the findings of the previous uh, presentations. So over to you, Seya. Well, thank you, Matt. Uh, Ming Lava, all my colleagues. Uh, so uh, instead of going uh, point by point uh, on the presentations, I, I will go uh, overall view on uh, their findings and what is actually happening in mass uh, crop value chains. So the uh, most important thing to note is when we talk about the crop value chains, uh, there are 
both short and long supply chains, value chains. Uh, we need to consider separately the local, uh, the regional, uh, the, uh, the the value chain, and also the uh, the value chain for the wholesale market, the cities and uh, major cities and Yango Mandalay, and also uh, for the export, because these are quite different, and uh, we have to look into uh, separate uh, value chains. And the second thing is uh, uh, the field crops, the stable food and uh, horticultural crops, especially uh, fruits, vegetables, and uh, other crops which we consume daily, like onions, uh, garlic, uh, potato, and all these crops. So these are perishable in nature, and uh, we need to consider differently with the stable uh, grains. So the impact of uh, the, uh, the COVID on the crop value chains, uh, through the survey, we can see uh, there were various impacts uh, on the producers. And also this time, I'm very glad that the survey was done on uh, the upstream and also the midstream uh, stakeholders in the value chain. So I think uh, the uh, leave aside the restrictions of a movement, which is now over, I think the biggest challenge that all the stakeholders are facing now is the uh, access to market, uh, and particularly the decreased demand. Uh, because of the social distancing, uh, all the restaurants are still closed, hotels are closed, tourism is not yet uh, happening, uh, apart from a few domestic tourists started to travel to different areas, but it is still very small. So the biggest uh, impact comes from the demand from these restaurants and the hotels. So even uh, when we look at uh, rice, uh, the rice situation, for example, the most commonly consumed varieties like Osan rice and other higher quality rice are now in high stock. Uh, the prices are not that increasing because of the closure of all these restaurants. And in Myanmar's cultural tradition, another big uh, decrease in demand comes from charities uh, because usually we have a lot of donations in the monasteries, and also other in the rural areas, particularly. Uh, now we cannot see all these uh, donations and charity. So that dramatically reduces the demand of uh, a good quality uh, rice. So the export of rice is going well, as uh, the we have already exported uh, two point, uh, around 2.3 uh, million tons. And uh, the export uh, restriction is lifted and uh, definitely uh, we can reach uh, at least two and a half million tons by the end of this uh, fiscal year in uh, September. So the export situation is quite good for rice and for corn also as pointed out in the surveys this year it is quite an exception because the demand is high uh, from the Thai border and other normal trade channels. So the, there is a major conflict between the domestic uh, feed mills and the exporters. Exporters, they want to increase their export, but the feed millers, they said they need to import for the next two, three months because they are short of uh, feed corn, especially the one with the good quality. So these are the situations. So the same with the pulses. The pulses, we still have 400,000 tons uh, of the quota for India for this year. So the pulses uh, situation also is good. So that's why when we look at this value chain, we have to look at the export, very long value chain, but particularly for the domestic consumptions in the, within the own region, uh, that is uh, very important. Now, today we are looking at uh, all the stakeholders, including the people in the middle, 
the midstream uh, people, these are still very much neglected uh, during this COVID period. We talk about mostly for the growers, uh, for financing, for assistance, but uh, the people in the middle who are providing the retail uh, sales of the inputs, the mechanization services, the trucking, and the mailing. So they are, I, I will say, they are not missing in Myanmar. They are there. They are very active, but they have been neglected. So in the next post-COVID area, we also need to make them stronger. As pointed out in the uh, in the surveys, uh, we have to see how we could help them, and we need more integrated uh, solution, extending uh, working capital loans to the people in the middle midstream, and also we need to empower them, and we need to integrate them with other rural development activities. Uh, what is still lacking in our country is we still have no agree business value chain incubators so uh, we need more innovative innovative approaches to help the people who are providing very important services to the agricultural production and the next of course the important uh, area is agricultural financing because all the presenters, they pointed out uh, various constraints and the needs in uh, access to finance. But here, I would like to raise one question. Uh, for the growers, particularly for the farmers, uh, they have now more access to finance, not only MADB, but through other microfinancing institutions also. But the biggest question is, are, are they willing to take the loans or the credits because of the high risk and because of lack of uh, market? What's the use of uh, getting more money to invest if they cannot sell the produce? So I think that's why we need to look at different uh, producers, maybe petty pulses, Maybe okay, but what about the uh, the the other vegetable growers, potato growers? As we can see, the worst hit vegetable growers in Shan State are at the cabbage growers, and also the tomato growers. So for them, uh, even though the financing is available, they may not take it. They will produce with whatever they have, and the same goes with the input procurement purchase of inputs. Uh, the, the inputs are in the market and uh, they may use less because if they use more fertilizer and the losses will be higher and they will have higher debt. So they will naturally use less fertilizer. So I think we should also look into the risk aspect and the demand aspect, why they are using less inputs and why they are not uh, getting more loans. Uh, so I think this is very important uh, point to consider. And the next point that I would like to raise here, which is uh, not included in, in our studies is the value addition side, because we have very weak uh, value added industries and uh, we still have no the territorial uh, planning to understand the competitive and comparative, comparative advantages of uh, different commodities that we are producing. So this is the weakest link in the crop value chain. So we need to also look more towards the downstream, downstream side, which includes uh, post-harvest and storage, because the lack of storage also is a very important factor for the farmers. So particularly in the time of crisis like this, uh, storage is uh, very important. So we need to engage more on uh, the linkages between the farmers and also the processors and also the buyers. 
So there is a growth of uh, the retail markets. Uh, there is a growth of supermarkets in uh, major cities. And uh, now we have a wholesale markets in Yango. But the linkage between the farmers and these markets are still very weak. And we still need a lot of assembly uh, markets, assembly type uh, facilities where the farmers can assemble the commodities and sell it to these uh, retail uh, retailers and also the wholesalers. So th this is uh, the, the, the one issue that we should consider uh, more on the downstream uh, uh, value added uh, side. And then uh, the presentations also pointed out on the, the weak uh, information. And the information is key uh, to overcome this kind of a crisis. Uh, information in terms of uh, crop production. There is no regular uh, the dissemination of uh, information from the uh, government departments also. Uh, seasonally, uh, in the past, there were crop and season reports and crop forecasting estimations. I think these are very important. And also the market information service. The, not only the price, but the market, market trends and the supply and also the uh, demand situation. So these are very important. And these all pointed out also the need for the digital technology. So we have to use more of a digi digital platforms for this kind of information, as well as to provide the e-extension services. Uh, the need for extension is quite uh, big in our country. And uh, we still have an outdated extension uh, system. So we need to move very quickly towards uh, uh, the digital extension services uh, to understand more about these uh, crop value chains. And also, the uh, policy implications are also very important, uh, particularly the import policy. The import policy of uh, edible oil seeds, for example, uh, whether we will allow the import of uh, readily refined uh, cooking oil, and uh, how are we going to encourage the domestic uh, edible oil milling industries in the downstream. And the same thing with the sugar industry, the import of sugar. And uh, we have to look into uh, the domestic sugar millers and also how we could help them to compete with other uh, importers of the sugar. So the import and export policies are also very important. So that's why uh, if we want to reduce the impact and to overcome the uh, in the post COVID area, what we need to do is uh, we need more innovative and also we need to look at more of a, a transformation of agriculture sector, uh, including the restructuring of the uh, existing uh, the institutions and also the capacity building. Uh, the CERP and the forthcoming World Bank's uh, $200 million loans, uh, these includes many good programs. But the question is whether we have the capacity to implement all these programs. So that's why uh, these are the points that we should consider in uh, solving the problems uh, that are raised in the presentations. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Asaya. You always have a way of putting this, these complex issues in the context of a longer, longer term development challenges, and we appreciate that. Well, now we're gonna move on to our uh, panel discussions. Uh, so uh, if we could have all the presenters and panelists put on their camera, that'd be great. If you've not had a chance to enter a question uh, in the question box, please do so now. 
And I'm going to start out a question. I'm going to combine a few of the questions that have been presented uh, all on a similar topic. Um, Mike uh, Ackester uh, talked about from Joey's presentation, smallholder farmers seeming like they're going into subsistence mode. Uh, Mohammed Manur, Manur was asking during uh, Ted's presentation about um, the uh, what coping strategies are farmers employing, and, and uh, we heard a bit of that from the Mercy Corps work. So I just asked uh, our, our three presenters to just talk about, um, you know, the do we see farmers uh, being more cautious, being more um, risk adverse, uh, like the, uh, Uta was talking about, and then what strategies are they using to cope? So maybe we'll start with Joey. <laughs> Sorry. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's it's tough to say from from my surveys exactly what's happening on on the farms, um, but I, I would say that that would be a, a rational response uh, to the uncertainty caused by the crisis to kind of um, stabilize and and produce um, more. Uh, yeah, for own consumption. But uh, yeah, I guess the the comment I will make is on. The vegetable seed uh, result, which is that those sales are pretty stable, um, selling to to households that are growing for own own consumption, uh, seed sa sales seem to be stable. So that would be evidence to it. But I think maybe uh, deeper insights could come from the the farm level surveys. Yeah, would you like to uh, contribute? Yeah, uh, sure. So from our farmer surveys. We definitely see uh, farmers are kind of reducing their investments in terms of uh, pesticides, inputs, and fertilizers. They are quite uh, reducing their investments in these uh, areas. And but we do see farmers saying, like uh, maybe 40% of farmers are saying that they will uh, grow as usual, like previous years. But we do see some of them saying uh, they will uh, reduce uh, hiring laborers. They will change to uh, harvesting uh, from Transplanting to reduce investments in the labor, uh, to reduce their labor costs. Uh, we do see this kind of coping mechanisms for farmer sites. Yeah. Uh, why you? Would you like to talk about some of the findings you have? Uh, uh, from uh, our assessment, uh, it was found that, uh, among others, uh, the uh, the needs uh, to consume less foods and borrowing money. It's kind of to common uh, uh, coping mechanism uh, in regards to uh, food insecurity that uh, uh, the, whenever uh, the, the, the smallholders uh, face uh, any any uh, uh, yeah uh, food insecurity situation. So, uh, but uh, they also mentioned about uh, reducing frequency of meals, uh, need to sell assets uh, and other things also. So yeah, so this this kind of uh, a common uh, coping uh, mechanism that uh, might be uh, employed by, by by farmers. Thank you. There was a, a couple clarifying questions. Uh, one on the presentation uh, by Joey on the maize opportunity, and Utintatu, you might be able to uh, provide some input. Uh, Ma Sandar Mio asked, "Does the does the maize exports or the price uh, the price of maize or maize sales?" Does that include uh, sweet corn as well, or just uh, feed corn? Uh, it's just mostly <clears throat> feed corn. Sweet corn is more of a short uh, value chain, <clears throat> mostly for the regional consumptions, except some sweet corn along the china Myanmar border. Uh, in the early days of COVID, we can see due to closure and the restrictions and the export, farmers uh, dumping all the sweet corns in, into the river. But uh, when we talk about uh, corn prices, we are mainly talking about feed corn. And that's true in, in our survey as well, the traders, the, the maize crop was separate from the sweet corn uh, as a category for traders. So the result about maize prices was for maize and not sweet corn. And I guess uh, following up on rice uh, is um, if rice is hard to buy and sell, uh, this is from Mike Exter, uh, was the rice stored and did the quality suffer during the storage? And was that part of the price uh, decrease? And then if you talked a little bit, Joey, about a consolidation of traders and is that uh, do we foresee monopolies taking place? Um, any thoughts um, 
some more panelists might have on that. Uh, Utin Tadu, you might want to take a first stab. Well, uh, rice, I would say, uh, because of the Myanmar Rice Federation and uh, other associations like Miller Associations, Trader Associations, uh, it is very well uh, organized. Even uh, the uh, policy advocacy, getting access to market, these are driven by the uh, associations. So it, it is also a very good example for other commodities, how a strong uh, private sector uh, associations could help. And for rice this year, for example, the government worries about the food security and the need to support, uh, uh, provide rice to the poor. So immediately uh, the export was uh, stopped. Uh, in the early days, and the government started the stockpiling policy. The exporters are given a quotas and they have to sell 25% uh, broken amata to the government. Now the government has about 50,000 tons of stock. So 10% of the export, they have to sell at the fixed price to the government. So even now, after re relieving a certain uh, export uh, restrictions now the export restrictions is no more uh, but uh, the the stock piling policy is there and the exporters are required to sell five percent to the government so the uh, the rice stock situation is okay and uh, the exporters are also quite happy but uh, the uh, the the exporters when they sell ten percent or now the five percent the the market price is higher so they are facing certain losses so once a government has enough uh, stock that should be also abolished all right thank you um we have a question from pam fessenden and it's it uh highlights some of the findings about uh, retailers, wholesalers, traders uh, using uh, mobile technologies uh, more and more innovating. And I know that's something Proximity has, has worked a lot on, I'm sure probably Mercy Corps as well. But she says, I was interested to hear about the increase in mobile phone use by upstream and midstream actors in the agri-food system, particularly related to mobile payments. Do we have a good sense of the role of mobile money in the agri-food system in Myanmar, inclusive of at the farm level, an extension of credit and payments? And I know it, that accounted for a rather small portion, the, the, the mobile wallet portion, but I don't know if, um, if Ted, if you want to talk a little bit about some of the proximity finance and some of the, what you're seeing farmers uh, are using these kind of mobile payments. Yeah, uh, sure. So uh, we do see that farmers are using a lot of um, cell to order their imports and also save their crops, but uh, in terms of providing payment, uh, we don't see a match increase or increased adoption at the moment yet. So for proximity finance, we are, yeah, uh, for proximity finance, uh, we are currently trying to use uh, tablets, but uh, it still needs like in-person delivery of like in-person delivery um, of uh, disbursement. But for, uh, we are trying to use uh, mobile tablets for applications and uh, trying to use more digital uh, applications for that. But mobile payment is still quite limited amount of farmers. Why you uh, is Mercy Corps involved with some digital payments? Uh, uh, no, not not really. I mean, uh, we we don't we don't really have the data around that. But uh, the assessment actually also found that farmers uh, reported uh, increased use of uh, the phone by thirty percent, which is quite uh, significant, I think. And this may indicate somehow, uh, yeah. Uh, the i mean the, the opportunity of, of uh, pushing more on the use of digital solutions in in, in the agriculture sector and i, I think uh, from the joy presentation uh, it was also mentioned the increase of uh, the use of mobile phone by uh, market actors i think okay, okay. uh just wanted to add a few comments uh so basically, uh, the question was about mobile payments, but I do think that farmers are getting more digitally savvy. Uh, we have been using chatbots uh, to uh, for target adoption campaigns. So we have been uh, a lot of 
doing a lot of uh, campaigns regarding different practices for farmers, uh, for example, like seed selection and preparation techniques uh, to educate the farmers. And we have uh, for proximity side, uh, we have around 800,000 uh, followers uh, in our Facebook, Facebook campaigns. So we see that uh, farmers are using more and more uh, Facebook for their uh, information uh, to get more information about agronomy and other type of uh, information. And uh, yeah, so we think, uh, I do think that farmers are getting more digitally savvy, but not when uh, in terms of many mobile payments, they, are, they don't really trust, they say don't really trust uh, mobile systems yet, yeah. Okay, we have a question, uh, Duncan, I'll direct this one to you. It's a hard one, so <laughs> lucky you. No, it says, this is from Mike uh, Exeter. He says, have you seen a move by government to modify land use policy during the, this response to COVID to stimulate land use diversification and flexible production systems in response? Well, thank you very much, Michael, for that question. Um, I, I would like to, if I may, just uh, congratulate all the speakers, uh, Tet Nin, A, Yu, and Joey. Uh, I thought you did a fantastic job. It was a very, very rich set of presentations. So congratulations to you. Uh, also, a quick word of greetings to uh, my Mawali colleagues before I start speaking about land policy. Um, so I, I think that uh, you know, important progress has been made in land policy, particularly with the na national land use uh, policy. Um, and as always, the challenge is one of implementation. Uh, certainly at the very, very beginning of the current administration, uh, early in January 2017, the ministry published its new policy and strategic thrust. And it made a commitment right from the get-go to make uh, land use more flexible. And within the capacity of the law at that time, they were able to provide a freedom of seasonal crop choice. And that they did immediately. So farmers have freedom of seasonal crop choice. The challenge then becomes one of a permanent conversion of paddy land to some other form of enterprise. And uh, I suspect, uh, knowing Michael well, that he's quite interested in conversion of paddy to aquaculture, for example. But this is also a problem for livestock. It's a problem for uh, horticulture, any kind of permanent land use. Uh, so this requires a change in the law. And Parliament had planned to uh, uh, bring to debate a proposal to allow smallholder farmers to convert one third of their paddy land to uh, alternative use up to a maximum of 15 acres. Uh, unfortunately, it wasn't possible to put that legislation forward in the last session, um, but uh, Parliament, and because this is a question of law, Parliament has to take the initiative, is planning to uh, improve this flexibility. It's also important to remember that most of these permanent alternative uses, as you know very well, Michael, require a lot more cash flow to purchase inputs. Uh, they also carry higher risks. And so it's important to have appropriate financial and insurance instruments that will go with that legal right to convert paddy land to permanent alternative use. So I think progress has been made. I think progress will continue to be made. Uh, uh, but changing law is not a simple one. Thank you. Thank you, Duncan. So uh, we are going to, uh, we originally scheduled it to end at 10.30, but we're gonna extend it a little bit longer uh, to have to take a few more questions. Um, a few, we had a few questions about details of the survey, about townships, regions. So for those questions, uh, these, these um, presentations and the webinar will be posted on the IFPRI Myanmar website, so you can access uh, these presentations and get into more detail or contact the presenters. Uh, so I'm not gonna um, address too many of those uh, during this time. There are a few questions about uh, the impact of the border with China and, and trade in terms of inputs, but also in terms of uh, exports. Uh, so Joey, I don't know if, uh, 
if any of the uh, input dealers had talked about that impacting their supply? Um, yeah, uh, definitely. So um, what I can say for sure is that uh, inputs, particularly fertilizer, uh, we're experiencing longer um, order times on, uh, from input retailers. Um, and the primary uh, origin country for the fertilizer for our sample uh, is China. So um, I think anecdotally also there's evidence from traders uh, uh, of restrictions on the border trade um, impacting uh, their activities. And, and one trader actually um, moved them, so physically moved um, themselves from uh, Muse to uh, the Thai border uh, to, to continue uh, trading activities. So um, absolutely, it's, it's a huge, uh, had a huge impact. Um, but I will say that um, even within Myanmar, um, you know, transport restrictions have been an issue. So people getting inputs from the same township have had issues um, uh, sourcing them and delays longer uh, delivery times than, than the year before. So um, yes, imports are, and, and border trade is important, but also even domestically, uh, transport has been affected. And along the lines of transport, in the different surveys, um, the, the restrictions, uh, were these, is your understanding for the farmers that you surveyed or the, the market actors, that the restrictions were imposed, um, uh, the, the main issues about limiting restrictions were most, uh, opposed from the, the union level or mostly how they were applied at the local level? Uh, I would say uh, it's very local. Um, we see a lot of regional differences and, and even within different states and regions, um, you know, some people are having no issues and, and others are saying, no, we, we you know, it, it's still locked down, it's still curfews. Um, and so uh, I think the implementation at a very local level um, is is still um, having an effect. Why you uh, in in your survey? Did you find what did you find? Yeah, I mean, I mean uh, uh, as Joe mentioned, uh, there's certainly challenges around uh, transportation within uh, districts or among, uh, within townships and between them. And uh, again, like uh, different townships experience uh, different things uh, from the survey in that, that for example. Uh, quite uh, open while if we talk about uh, Laputa, Miamia, or uh, Bogale, then that's totally different stories uh, because of some measures uh, uh, which were uh, taken by the local authorities. So, yeah, so uh, uh, those are uh, phenomena uh, that's uh, happened in, in the Delta, uh, especially yes, in the main time frame. Yeah. Despite the essential service designation of some of these things, it was implemented differently. Ted, did uh, in the farmers you're continuing to sur survey them bi-weekly? Are things changing, getting more less restrictive? Yeah. So basically, for restrictions, uh, we see we saw the walls around late in April, especially in April to like early May. Now things are really getting more relaxed, especially in. Uh, at township level and also village level. We, we see a lot of differences even at the village level. Some of the villages were actually allowing, not allowing brokers uh, coming into the villages at the time. Uh, some of them allowing brokers into the village. So there were a lot of differences even at the village level, yeah. Well, I think uh, uh, these kind of issues uh, needs a closer coordination and cooperation between the uh, union as well as among the state and regional governments. Uh, some good suggestions like uh, opening up the green lane during the crisis of the cabbage and uh, other fresh uh, vegetables, and also export of mangoes to uh, Malaysia and uh, Singapore. So these exporters and traders, they requested the government to open up a, a special green lane uh, to transport all these commodities as well as to pass through the uh, border trades and also the customs in the port. I think uh, these kind of things will help a lot. So I think these are more or less, uh, I think, uh, the closer coordination and cooperation between the uh, regional uh, and state authorities. I think that will help a lot to the producers. And for the border trade with China, I think uh, 
uh, it will become a, a new normal, uh, even without COVID, because China is trying to uh, regulate and formalize the trade. Uh, so that's why in the future, if you if we want to sell something across the border, we need more uh, uh, the protocols, SPS protocols and trade agreements. Uh, if we look at other neighboring countries, Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand, Laos, they all have established all these frameworks, but we still do not have such a proper, uh, regular, uh, formal trade facilities along our border points. So that is very important, both for export and import uh, from China and also Thai border. And these facilities has to be upgraded and strengthened. Thank you. You're right. This is a, a good opportunity to uh, upgrade in that context, going from informality to, to formality. Uh, good opportunity. Okay. Um, we uh, have, There's a lot of interest and we have a lot of questions and unfortunately we don't have the time to get to all of them. But I, I do want to ask all the panelists, because you all come uh, from different perspectives, whether it's academic, NGO, private sector, you know, representative government uh, interest, just um, of the, in order to uh, you know, the reality is these pandemics, you can't predict them, but, um, you know, there's a probability that there could be a second wave or another lockdown. How do we prepare uh, going forward so that we can respond better to shocks like this? And so maybe we'll start and it just, uh, you know, doesn't have to be a long, just uh, some, some, uh, some core nuggets. Uh, and Duncan, we'll start with you. Well, thank you very much, Matt. Uh, so let me address this in, in two steps. Uh, we are not through this pandemic. We are right at the very beginning of this pandemic. Uh, the monsoon season is a very difficult season for most rural households. It's, 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 it's difficult to earn money. Uh, the cost of food supplies goes up. Uh, we know that the monsoon season is sometimes referred to as the lean season, in some places the hungry season. This is a difficult season for rural populations. And to see the data from Tetnin A and also from YU, they came out with extremely close numbers. 60% of farmers not being sure how they can make ends meet at a very early stage in the monsoon season. Where is, why do we have this liquidity crunch so early in the monsoon season? And I think we have to remember the previous uh, discussion that we had about loss of remittances. Uh, about one in three rural households depend on remittances. And a high proportion of households have lost those remittances. And the fact that they, they don't have that income to spend, whether it be on inputs or food from their neighbors or services from their neighbors, spills over to the rural. The, the broader rural economy. Uh, so I think there is a, a significant liquidity uh, constraint, both because on the income side, as well as in terms of the access to loans. And, and I, I think uh, the government should be congratulated on, on taking very bold steps with the comprehensive economic recovery program, especially with this additional COVID-19 loan. Uh, but one question I would have is, do we have accurate information about how quickly these MADB loans are being dispersed? Uh, I, I think that's a very important uh, indicator to be monitoring in the near term is how quickly these loans uh, uh, get out there. Um, and, and this then kind of segues into the issue of the future and the build, the build back better. And, and Pam Fessenden had this question about digital payments. And I, I think if there is one single intervention that would help us build back better is digital agriculture on the finance side on the information side on the service delivery side uh, if, if we can uh, accelerate the process of digital agriculture and digital payments then we would be in a much uh, better place to be responsive to these liquidity constraints at all levels in the system. We've talked about rural households and farmers. Uh, we've talked about traders and exporters. And as Utintu very rightly said, the neglected 
uh, small and medium enterprises that provide really important services uh, to, to enable farmers both to, to procure services as well as to sell their output. So definitely uh, digital payments and, and digital agriculture will really help build back better. Thank you. Thank, thank you, doctor. Uh, Joey, how about you? Um, yeah, that was a good answer. Um, so I don't know if I have too much to add, but I will say just from, uh, uh, it's clear from, from kind of our, our initial reading of these phone surveys that, um, the informal credit and, and lending, uh, happening is, is, is it's stressing, uh, these small and medium enterprises. Um, they're absorbing a lot of it and they're taking on debt and, and, and trying to, um, facilitate the continued flow uh, through the agri-food system. So um, yeah, if a second wave came and there was nothing done uh, to support that, um, I don't know what would happen. I think it would be, um, you know, there'd be continued knock-on effects. It wouldn't affect everyone, but it would it would affect these small and medium enterprises that really kind of drive the whole agri-food system. So uh, some type of policy in place to to get liquidity and cash and, and loans to these actors would be uh, essential should there be a second wave. Thank you. Why are you? Yeah, we, we, we learned that the, the, the crisis uh, exposes the fragilities uh, in our food system. And uh, while uh, CERP uh, is somehow helpful, but uh, I think it was quite late and, and to be honest, we are not ready with the, uh, any worse uh, scenario uh, as uh, Duncan mentioned that uh, we need to think long term about this uh, pandemic. And I think it is a good time uh, for Myanmar to revisit again the CERP and, and uh, really uh, seriously looking at uh, these uh, different stimulus and, and uh, come up with a more rigorous and uh, thoughtful uh, uh, plan, uh, yeah, putting in account the worst case scenario uh, for the country. I think that's that's from from uh, my side. Yeah. Thank you. Ted, I'd like to share some thoughts from proximity's perspective. Sure. Uh, I totally agree with uh, Professor Duncan's answer, like uh, better connectivity of farmers. From farmers' side, of course, uh, better connectivity with other value chain actors, uh, like uh, input shops and also traders and brokers, would allow them to better prepare for the, if, if even if the second wave is coming, uh, for to create demand and to deliver their crops and produce to the uh, to the end users to the uh, traders and um, brokers. I think they were at least uh, allow them to create uh, uh, to create income uh, if they if there's any second wave, yeah. And another thing is, of course, uh, like uh, Professor Denton mentioned, uh, loans, uh, of course, uh, there are a lot of um, plans for loan disbursement from MFIs and MADV, but there has been a lot of disruptions in their operations. And uh, from our surveys, we have seen that uh, over 39%, 30% of farmers are staying waiting for the, their regular loans, like from MEDV. So, uh, so they're staying waiting for their loans and they are uh, probably in July or August. So uh, I think uh, early, early disbursement, timely disbursement of loans will be very important for them as well. Thank you. Hu Tintaru, would you uh, like to provide some, some thoughts on this topic? Well, uh... I think uh, the business as usual will never work again. It is a new normal and uh, both private sector and government should uh, think of a new ways of doing it. Uh, especially uh, as we have witnessed from the surveys, uh, revenue is dropping over 20% for all the stakeholders uh, through the value chain. So. The more the period prolongs, the more they will need working capital. And the most important thing is immediately what we can do is how to defer or suspend the uh, repayments. Uh, the tractor sales, for example, are now coming back. But the most important 
the, diff the difficulty that they are facing is uh, the repayment or the payment of installments. So from July until December, everybody will face difficulties to repay the, uh, what they owe. So I think a suspension or deferring the payment will help all the stakeholders, particularly the, the farmers. Uh, so that, that two things is very important and creating more jobs. Uh, the, the remittances, for example, like Moon State and ARD and Magui region, most farming families, they rely on remittances. Now they have no more remittances, but they have more mouth to feed at home. So I think creating more jobs also is very important. So unless we can immediately take action on these, uh, there will be more difficulties and even uh, threatening the food security. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. And uh, I apologize to all those who entered in questions that we didn't have time to get to. There were there were there were a lot. They were flooding down down the screen. I tried to grab as many as I could and group them together. But I encourage you to reach out directly if you have a question that didn't get answered to our presenters, uh, our panelists, and I'm sure they can answer it uh, in no problem. So uh, in conclusion, uh, on behalf of the members of the Agriculture and Rural Development Sector Coordination Group, I'd like to th thank our presenters today for sharing the results of their surveys, for making insightful observations on the current status and future direction of development in the agri-food system in rural communities, the decrease in demand for inputs and services uh, that threatened uh, firm inputs, but it's also driving innovation to reach consumers through our customers through ICT solutions. Lower household incomes for farmers has resulted in increased demand for value chain financing from traders and uh, um, service providers. Their ability to maintain adequate cash flows and extend credit is unclear, and it's something that needs to be closely monitored. The time and execution of the government's efforts to support MFIs to help, will help relieve this strain, as well as SME loans and refinancing efforts under the Comprehensive Economic Recovery Plan. The second tranche of SME loans is targeted towards the agriculture sector. And in future surveys, we need to capture if this is reaching these key value chain actors. These surveys are critical as we monitor the ongoing impact of COVID-19 on the economy. We can use them to help adjust our response to be more efficient in targeting resources and make adjustments, adjustments in the enabling environment. I thank you all for your participation today and for the many questions. Again, the members of the Agriculture and Rural Development Sector Coordination Group plan to hold several more webinars in the coming months on topics such as the impact of COVID-19 on the livestock and fisheries value chains and how these shocks are impacting the food security of households and communities. We find that these webinars are a good way to rapidly share information and if you have an idea for a webinar topic, then I encourage you to reach out to myself or Mrs. Fan at the FAO and we can discuss. Thank you again for spending this time with us. I'd like to give a final thank you to our presenters and our panelists. And with that, we'd like to conclude this webinar. Jason Timbade, and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.